who is God then? Let's try to sneak up to this question if it's at all possible. Is it possible to even talk about this? Well, it better be because otherwise there's no communicating about it, right? It, it has to be something that can be brought down to earth. Well, we might be too dumb to bring it down. It's not just ignorant, it's also sinful, right? So, because there's not knowing, and then there's not wanting to know or refusing to know. Yeah. And so you might say, well, could you extract God from a description of the objective world, right? Is is God just the ultimate unity of, 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 of the natural reality? And I would say, well, in a sense, there's some truth in that, but but not exactly, because God, in the highest sense, is the spirit that you must emulate in order to thrive. How's that for a biological definition? Spirit is a pattern. The spirit that you must emulate in order to thrive. So it's a, it's a kind of, uh, in one sense, when we say the human spirit, mm -hmm. it's that. It's an animating principle. Yeah. It's a meta, it's a pattern. Okay. And you might say, well, what's the pattern? Okay, well, I can tell you that to some degree. Imagine that, like you're gripped by beauty, you're gripped by admiration. So, and you can just notice this. This isn't propositional. You have to notice it. It's like, oh, turns out I admire that person. Hmm. So what does that mean? Well, it means I would like to be like him or her. That's what admiration means. It means there's something about the way they are that compels imitation, another instinct, or inspires respect or awe even. Okay, what is that that grips you? Well... I don't know. Well, let's say, okay, fine, but it grips you, and you want to be like that. Kids hero worship, for example, and so do adults, for that matter, unless they become <laughs> entirely cynical. I worship quite a, quite a few heroes. Yeah, well, there you go. Proudly. Yes, well, yeah. there you go. And there's no, that worship, that celebration and, and proclivity to imitate is worship. That's what worship means, most fundamentally. Now, imagine you took the set of all admirable people, and you extracted out AI learning, you extracted out the central features of what constitutes admirable. And then you did that repeatedly until you purified it to what was most admirable. That's as good as you're going to get in, in terms of a representation of God. And you might say, well, I don't believe in that. It's like, well, what do you mean? Yeah. It's not a set of propositional facts. It's not a scientific theory about the structure of the objective world. And then I could say something about that too, because I've been thinking about this a lot, especially since talking to Richard Dawkins. It's like, okay, the postmodernist types, going back way before Derrida and Foucault, maybe back to Nietzsche, who I admire greatly, by the way, says, God is dead. It's like, okay. But Nietzsche said, God is dead and we have killed him and we'll not find enough water to wash away all the blood. So that was Nietzsche. He's no fool. He's got a way with words. He certainly does. And so then you think, okay, well, we killed the transcendent. Well, what does that mean for science? Well, it frees it up because all that nonsense about a deity is just the idiot superstition that stops the scientific um, what process from moving forward. That's basically the new atheist claim, something like that. It's like, wait a second. Do you believe in the transcendent if you're a scientist? And the answer is, well, not only do you believe in it, you believe in it more than anything else, because if you're a scientist, you believe in what objects to your theory more than you believe in your theory. Now, we got to think that through very carefully. So your theory describes the world, and as far as you're concerned, your description of the world is the world. But because you're a scientist, you think, well, even though that's my description of the world, and that's what I believe. There's something beyond what I believe, and that's the object. And so I'm going to throw my theory against the object and see where it'll break. And then I'm going to use the evidence of the break as a source of new information to revitalize my theory. So as a scientist, you have to posit the existence of the ontological transcendent before you can move forward at all. But more, you have to posit that contact with the ontological transcendent, annoying though it is because it upsets your apple cart, is exactly what will in fact set you free. So then you accept the proposition that there is a transcendent reality, 
and that the that contact with that transcendent reality is redemptive in the most fundamental sense because if it wasn't well why would you bother making contact with it you're going to make everything worse or better why does the uh contact with the transcendent set you free as a scientist because you assume that you assume i mean freedom in the most fundamental sense it's like well freedom from want freedom from disease freedom from ignorance right that it informs you so it's the, the logos in it of science it is definitely that. Yeah, it's it's the it's the direction, let's say the directionality of science, that's a narrative direction, not a scientific direction. And then the question is what is the narrative? Well, it posits a transcendent reality. It posits that the transcendent reality is corrective. It posits that our knowledge structures should be regarded with humility. It posits that you should bow down in the face of of the transcendent evidence. And you have to take a vow, you know this as a scientist, you have to take a vow to follow that path if you're going to be a real scientist. It's like the truth, no matter what, and that means you posit the truth as a redemptive force. Well, what does redemptive mean? Well, why bother with science? Well, so people don't starve, so people can move about more effectively, so life can be more abundant, right? So it's all ensconced within an underlying ethic. So the, re the reason I, I was saying that while we were talking about belief in God, it's like, this is a very complicated topic, right? Do you believe in a transcendent reality? See, so okay, now let's say you buy the argument I just made on the natural front. And you say, yeah, yeah, that's just nature. That's not God. And then I'd say, well, what makes you think you know what nature is? Like, see, the th problem with that argument is that it, it already presumes a materialist, a reductionist, materialist, objective view of what constitutes nature. But if you're a scientist, you're going to think, well, in the final analysis, I don't know what nature is. I certainly don't know its origin or destination point. I don't know its teleology. I'm really ignorant about nature. And so when I say it's nothing but nature, I shouldn't mean it's nothing but what I understand nature to be. So I could say, will we have a fully reductionist account of cognitive processes? And the answer to that is yes, but by the time we do that, our understanding of matter will have transformed so much that what we think of as reductionist now won't look anything like yes. what we think of reductionism now. Matter isn't dead dust. I don't know what it is. I have no idea what it is. Matter is what matters. There's a definition. That's a very weird definition. But the notion that we have you know, that if you're a reductionist, a materialist reductionist, that you can reduce the complexity of what is to your assumptions about the nature of matter. Yeah. That's not a scientific Your specific limited human assumptions of this century, of this week, that... So in, in some sense, without God in this complicated, big definition we're talking about, the there's no humility or... It's there's less, not enough. There's less likely to be, or rather science can err in taking a trajectory away from humility. Well. Without something much more powerful than an uh, individual human. Yeah, well then, and we know, you know, the Frankenstein story comes out of that instantly. And <laughs> that's a good story for the current times. It's like, you, you're you playing around with making new life? you bloody well better sh make sure you have your arrows pointed up. And it's interesting because you said science has um, an ethic to it. Mm -hmm. I think- It's embedded in an ethic. Well, there's a, you know, science is a big word. Yeah. And it includes a lot of disciplines that have different traditions. So biology, chemistry, uh, genetics, physics, uh, those are very different communities. And I think biology, especially when you get closer and closer to medicine and to the human body, does have a very serious, first of all, it has a history with Nazi Germany of being abused and all those kinds of things, but it has a history of taking this stuff seriously. Mm -hmm. What doesn't have a history of taking this stuff seriously is robotics and artificial intelligence, which is really interesting because you don't, uh, you know, you called me a scientist, but, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I would like to wear that label proudly, but often people don't think of computer science as a science, but nevertheless, it will be, I think, the science of one of the major scientific fields of the 21st century, and you should take that very seriously. Oftentimes when people build robots or AI systems, they think of them 
as uh, toys to tinker with. Oh, isn't this cool? Mm-hmm. Well, and that, I feel this too. Isn't this cool? It is cool. But you know, uh, at a certain moment, you might. Isn't this nuclear uh, explosion cool? Y- yeah, because it is. Or birth control pill cool? It's like or or transistor cool? Yeah. Well, the other thing too, and and this is a weird problem in some sense. The robotics engineer types, they're thing people, right? I mean, the big classes of interest are interest in things versus interest in people. Some of my best friends are thing people. Yeah, right. And uh, thing people are very, very clear, logical thinkers, and they're very outcome-oriented and practical. Now, and that's all good. That makes the machinery and keeps it functioning. But there's a human side of the equation. And and you get the extreme thing people, and you think, yeah, well, what about the human here? And when we're talking about, we've been talking about the necessity of having a technological enterprise embedded in an ethic, and you can ignore that, like most of the time, right? You can ignore the overall ethic in some sense when you're toying around with your toys. But when you're building an artificial intelligence, it's like, well, that's not a toy. That might be toy becomes the monster very quickly. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. And and this is a whole new kind of monster. And maybe it's already here. Yes, and you notice how many of those things you can no longer turn off. Now, what is it with you engineers and your inability to put off switches on things now? It's like, I have to hold this for five seconds for it to shut off. Or I can't figure... I just want to shut it off. Click off. Well, what is it with you humans that don't uh, put off switches on other humans? Because there's a magic to the thing that you notice, and it hurts uh, for both you and perhaps one day the thing itself to turn it off. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be very careful as an engineer adding off switches to things. Um, I think it's a feature, not a bug, the off switch. The off switch gives a deadline to us humans, to Mm -hmm. systems, of existence, it makes you, uh, It's you know, death is the thing that really brings clarity to life. And I do think- Yes, hence the flaming swords. The flaming sword. I do like your view of the flame, of the bush, mm-hmm. and perhaps the sword as a thing of transformation. Mm-hmm. It's also, as a, it's a transformation that kind of consumes the thing in the process. Well, it depends on how much of the thing is chaff. You know, this is why you can't touch the Ark of the Covenant for example. And this is why people can have very bad psychedelic trips. It's like if you're 95% dead wood and you get too close to the flame, the 5% that's left might not be able to make it. So you think it's all chat, but I think there is some aspect of destruction that is, that's, you know, the the, the old Bukowski line of Mm -hmm. uh, do what you love and let it kill you. Right? Don't you think that destruction is part of... That's humility. That's humility. That's you bet, place. you bet, you bet. It's like, invite in the judgment. Invite in the judgment, <laughs> because maybe you can die a little bit instead of dying completely. Yeah. You know, and that's, I think it's Alfred North Whitehead. We can let our ideas die instead of us, right? We can have these partial personalities that we can burn off, and we can let them go before they become tyrannical pharaohs and, every, and we lose everything. And so, yeah, there's this optimal bite of death, and who knows what it would mean to optimize that. Like, what if it was possible that if you died enough all the time that you could continue to live? And the thing is, we already know that biologically because if you don't die properly all the time, well, it's cancerous outgrowths and and like it's a very fine balance between productivity on the biological front and the culling of that, right? Life is a real balance between growth and death. And so what would happen if you got that balance right? Well, we kind of know, right? Because if you live your life properly, so to speak, and you're humble enough to let your stupidity die before it takes you out, you will live longer. That's just a fact. Well, but then what's the ultimate extension of that? And the answer is we don't know. We have no idea. 